Ephesians chapter 4, and then I'm going to ask you to do what I don't like preachers doing. I'm going to ask you to turn to 1 Corinthians 12, too. I've always loathed that. I don't know if it's because I'm a rebellious spirit. I don't know. Don't tell me what to do. But I was, maybe I'm lazy. I don't like putting my finger in one passage and have it opened up. But you might want to do that because I'm not going to give you the liberty to turn to 1 Corinthians 12 after that. Um, we're going to read these two passages rather quickly. Because last week we introduced a new mini-series. It's entitled The Gifted. And uh, we talked about how every Christian is spiritually gifted. So if you're a believer today, you at some point in your life have acknowledged that you're a sinner. You've acknowledged that Jesus Christ is the Savior because of His death, burial, and resurrection. And you've asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've done that, then you are born again. Then you are a believer in Jesus Christ. You're a child of God. You're a Christian. You've been born into the family of God. You're a member of the body of Christ. How, how does that sound? That sounds good, right? You're forgiven. You're redeemed. You're justified. you got all this good stuff that comes with it. If that's you, then the good news is you are also spiritually gifted. And we talked last week based on the passages that every Christian is gifted, every Christian is gifted by the grace of God, and every Christian is gifted by the grace of God for the glory of God. Not for ourselves, but for God's glory. And these truths that we discussed are going to have to guide us through the rest of our series because we're going to evaluate each of the gifts. So this will be a little more teachy than preachy than what you're used to, but I trust it will be helpful for you moving forward. Let's read Ephesians 4, a few verses in the chapter. Verse number 7, Paul the Apostle says to believers in Ephesus, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, When he, Jesus, ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts Unto men, verse 11, here are the gifts. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 1. Now, Paul writes to the believers in Corinth, Concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. I want you to know what they're all about. Verse 4, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Jump down to verse 28. Here's the list in Corinthians. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, I've added evangelists from Ephesians 4, thirdly teachers and pastors I've added, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Verse 29, he asks, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? So that's the list I have behind me of spiritual gifts, the categories, I should say, because we're going to talk about more than what's just listed behind me based on Romans chapter 12 and just using our own ability to reason. But I ask, as I asked last week, what is your spiritual gift? What is your spiritual gift? What has Christ enabled you to do with His grace to help edify or perfect or instruct or enhance the body of Christ? What has God enabled you in particular to do to help the body of believers you're surrounded with grow? Because God has a place for you in His church. God has a place for you to serve. That's why yesterday for me as a pastor was so successful. I certainly care about who we're ministering to in the community. You know my passion is to reach the members of our community, but I have a greater passion to help the body here grow. And I have this crazy idea that service helps us grow. I have this crazy idea that we, when we get out of our comfort zone and we serve others, it helps put others before us and we grow by learning to serve. No one else agrees with that, but I tell you, Jesus agrees with that. Yeah, we say amen here if you agree with it, oh me if you don't, and if you walk out during the sermon, that's the ultimate disagreement. So you can do that too. Uh, let, let it be known, we have guards at the door. So. 
So if you're a member of the body of Christ, where do you fit in? Because the way God designs the church is this picture a puzzle, and it's this big mat, and, and people are going to fit in. We're carved out to be perfect members of the body. And for you, there's a certain empty spot in the church, a certain empty place in the church that you're going to fit in, and you're going to fit in perfectly, and you're going to feel like you fit in. We use that phrase loosely, socially, but realistically, God is a place for you that when you find it, you will fit in. I wonder how many believers today across the world in churches feel like fish out of water. They go to church or they participate in church, but they just don't feel like they're fitting in. They feel like fish out of water. And the reality is because if God designed them to swim, they've got to find the water part of the church to swim in. If God designed you to fly, you've got to find the air in the church so that you can fly. And if, you, if you're like a worm and you were made to dig, you've got to find the dirt of the church and dig into it. Don't read too much into that part, but you understand what I mean. If God has gifted you with children, you will not be content spiritually just sitting in the pew because you'll want to be with the children. And until you get with the children, you won't feel like you're spiritually satisfied. If God has gifted you with music, it's not until you find the music ministry where you will feel like you fit in. I've been told I can use my brother-in-law, Nicholas Mangiafesto, for an illustration. He doesn't know this. His wife permitted this. Through my wife. Yeah. <laughs> Tara actually writes the sermon, so if you walk out, no offense, right there. But Nick and Emily went to another church prior to this church where they lived, which was a different area than this, and they liked that church. They liked the pastor. They liked the people. They had no complaints about the church. It was a good church for them. But when the pastor was going through spiritual gifts to some level, I don't know the extent of that conversation. Again, this is through my wife, through his wife, but... This conversation was being had, and, and my brother-in-law says, I, I don't know what I have to offer this church. I'm not sure what I can do. I, I guess I'll sign up to paint, because his father has a painting business, and he can paint well. And so he said, well, I'll paint. But typically, you don't paint every week. You don't paint every month. You know, once in a blue moon, especially in churches, you paint once 10 years. So where does he fit in? And as a result, they would go, and they would be as, a part of it as much as they could, and they did their best. But when he came here, his spiritual growth accelerated because somehow, some way, God directed him to the audio-video ministry. And you have to understand, my brother-in-law, he doesn't mind me saying this, but he can't sing a lick. That's why he's not in the choir. But what he does back there, I will tell you, it's not in the Bible, but he is spiritually gifted at. He does not have an ear to sing, yet when he records the audio and the voices, he blends them perfectly. And what he does for this church, every service he can attend, he does almost flawlessly because you don't know when there's any problems because there typically aren't. And what a blessing it is. If you've ever been in a church where there's constantly something wrong with the audio or the video, it's a significant distraction. But he fits in and he knows that. And I'll tell you, Nick will not miss a service unless he's working or he has some family uh, function way up in Lockport. You know why he doesn't miss a service? Because this is his place. He's, he has ownership now because he says, my puzzle piece will be missing if I'm not here. The body of Christ, it needs my puzzle piece. And that's not in any way uh, arrogant. That's him taking ownership in the ministry because he's found his place. You have a place, too. Now, people wouldn't be missing services as much as they do if they knew they needed to be there. Can you imagine if I didn't see my position as that important to the church and just came when I wanted to? Some of you are hoping I'd do that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I told you, Tara writes the sermons. But, but you understand the point being is a lot of us come to church because we feel we have to. We've got to get through the sermon to avoid pastor's text on Monday morning. But you have a place here. You've got to find that place, and that comes with your spiritual gift. So what is your spiritual gift? Today we're going to start talking about the big three. You say, what are the big three? The big three are the first two categories, the apostles, the evangelists, and prophets. And, and the evangelists and prophets are in one category. We're not going to get to that category today. We'll do that next week. Today we're just going to talk about the apostles. But these are the big three. 
And if you're familiar with, with the NBA at all, this phrase, the big three, has really grown over the years. And now the National Basketball Association, the teams focus on getting three big stars, and they build their 15-man roster around those three guys. I believe the church has been built around these three as well. I think this, this is the category or categories, the group that God is building the church and then builds around. That's why we're going to start with these three, separate them a little bit. They're just that important to the church. Now, as we begin our study in the spiritual gifts, I ask you to consider these things. Number one, ask God through the study what your spiritual gift is. Number two, I'd ask you to consider other believers around you and observe what their spiritual gift might be. Your perspective will be helpful to them. A lot of times we are uncomfortable acknowledging a spiritual gift because we feel, even though last week I documented it, we feel as though we might be a little proud if we acknowledge it. You know, if someone stood up, and if Nick stood up here and said, yeah, baby, I'm gifted with audio video, we would all think, sit down, son, right? But the reality is he does know that. He just doesn't want to say it. I can say it, I can see it, and it helps him fulfill that gift. So what I'm saying is look around at those that you know and ask yourself, God, what might their spiritual gift be? Because you might be able to come in and say, hey, you're gifted in this area, I see it, and help encourage them to utilize their gift. Number three, I'd encourage you to seek to enhance your biblical understanding of the topic that we're going through. This is new to many of you if you've not gone through the study, so it's something that will require some uh, attention and then memory of it. And then last of all, I ask you to be open because we might discuss some things that are new or different to you. There's a lot of opinion on spiritual gifts, and I don't want anyone to get stuck on any one thing. Let us be open to what God has for us. Turn to Mark chapter 3. Let's get going. Let's talk about the gift of apostleship. The gift of apostleship. Based on Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians 12, no doubt it is a spiritual gift. In both chapters that list the spiritual gifts, it is mentioned first, which, which is why I've placed it where it's at. The household of God, the church, as Paul puts it in Ephesians 2, was built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the, the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. Now, when I say apostles, if you have any uh, biblical background, the first and perhaps the only thing you're thinking of right now are the twelve. It's what we typically think of when you mention apostle apostleship, apostles, anything, you automatically go to the ministry of Jesus Christ and the 12 apostles he chose. That's fine. Uh, no doubt that when God, <clears throat> through Jesus, built his church, as Paul put on the foundation of the apostles, no doubt historically he is talking about the 12 apostles. Peter, of whom was the lead apostle, and he became, without question, the leader of the early church. But in order to help define the apostleship, I want you to look at the the general or more practical application beyond the historical, the most general and practical application is the apostles were used to build the church because the church had not been built and someone had to be the leaders. They had to be the builders. They had to be the ground of the church. The church of Christ started with the church in Jerusalem after the ascension of Jesus Christ and it was started by the apostles. From there, of course, the church would expand into regions, cities, countries, counties. It would go throughout the world. And the church would need more than the 12 apostles. He would need, God would need, Jesus would need additional preachers, preachers of the gospel. We call them missionaries. Or as Wilhelm Falk would call them, missionaries over in Germany. He loves his missionaries. The 12 apostles were the first of the apostles, but they were not the only apostles. Understand that the apostles were not called the apostles because they could cast out devils or because they could heal the sick. The twelve apostles were not called the apostles because of their miraculous nature of the ministry they, they had. They were called the apostles by Jesus because they were sent forth. Mark chapter 3, verse number 13 uh, the Bible says, read with me, And Jesus goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would. And they came unto him, and he ordained twelve, that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. Turn to Luke chapter 12 real quick, if you would mind. One book over, Luke chapter 12, verse number, or Luke chapter 6, rather. Verse number 12, this is a parallel passage. 
parallel being same account, different author, different perspective, different details, same story. Verse number 12 of Luke chapter 6. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. Okay, so you think apostles, casting out demons, healing the sick, twelve of them, legendary men of God. They were. However, the term apostle, look it up in a dictionary, simply means one sent forth. An apostle is simply an envoy. <clears throat> look it up in a dictionary. An apostle is simply a missionary. A missionary. The twelve apostles had a primary objective, and it was not to cast out devils or to heal the sick. That was to help them do their job, <clears throat> but their primary objective was to preach the gospel of Christ, or preach, in some cases, the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, in some cases. The twelve apostles were not called to teach Bible classes. They were not called to teach the children. They were not called to a children's ministry. They were not called to a music ministry. They were called to go preach Christianity to those who hadn't yet heard about it. It was all about going forth. Uh, you can read on your own time, Matthew chapter 10 is the first instruction Christ gave to his apostles, and he told them to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, whatever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy. He said, you guys are going to go everywhere. That's what your job is. You are ambassadors. You're, on, you're an envoy of Christianity. You're going to go and preach. The last instruction Jesus gave his apostles was, Mark 16, Mark 16, am I saying the wrong chapter, is it Mark 15, it's Mark 16, verse 15, isn't it? Go ye and <laughs> preach the gospel, Never, we're in trouble, we're in trouble. Did I convert you? It doesn't say go ye and feed the multitudes with chicken barbecue. It's go ye and preach the gospel to every living creature. The apostles were sent to go to the house of Israel at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. At the end, he said, all right, guys, go and preach the gospel. He didn't say go and, and do all these miracles. Go and preach the gospel. That's what an apostle is. The 12 apostles were missionaries. The 12 apostles were missionaries with God-given power unique to them and their, missionary, or, and their ministry. So the global church of Christ, the beginning of the church as we know it, this universal uh, church where it consists of all Christians uh, of all nations, it was started on the backs, the backs of apostles. So when the Word of God says that Jesus founded the church on the apostles and prophets, it's because they were the men that were sent to start it. Started in Jerusalem, and then they began to spread from there. Local churches of God, whether here in America or in any other country, they are built first upon the back of a missionary. Anytime Christianity makes it into a, a part of this world where it has not been preached, it goes there by an apostle. It goes there by a missionary. It doesn't go there by a Sunday school teacher. It doesn't go there by a music minister. It doesn't go there by a nursery worker. It goes there by a preaching man of God who we call our missionaries, but the Bible calls Apostles. Did you know the word missionary? As much as we use it, as much as we support it, it doesn't show up in the Bible anywhere. Did you know that? It's not a Bible word. The Bible word for missionary is apostle. So the spiritual gift of apostleship is being gifted with a missionary calling. Now here's the fun thing that I like to rattle some, some conservative uh, teachers with, the twelve apostles were not the only apostles in the Bible. Nor were they the only missionaries in the Bible. I can think of a guy that you all know really well. He came from Tarsus. His name used to be Saul. He was really bad to the church of God. And then he got saved and, and he became an apostle. He became Paul. He was a missionary to the world, to the Gentiles. Paul's co-worker Barnabas also was referred to as an apostle in Acts chapter 14, verse number 14. And it's very possible, it appears to me, that Paul called Silvanus and Timotheus apostles in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
But my favorite scripture of all in the Bible when it comes to apostle is Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 3, he was called our apostle and high priest. You say, why was Jesus an apostle? I always thought an apostle was a follower of Jesus Christ. No, an apostle is just someone who is sent forth. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus Christ was the first of all missionaries. He came from a foreign place called heaven to this earth to share with us that God loves us and he's about to give us forgiveness through his son. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Let's read a couple verses. Romans chapter 1, just to set the groundwork again for this spiritual gift. And something you probably never, ever considered for yourself as a spiritual gift, all of a sudden today should become possible. Something you always kind of delegated to history or delegated to somebody else, great figures of church history, now becomes potentially personal for you. Romans chapter 1, verse number 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Paul believed that he was called to be, a gospel, to be an apostle. Last week we talked about Paul telling us we have a general profession, a general calling, and then we have a specific calling. You as a believer, you're generally called to do the same thing that I'm called to do. Whether it's being holy, whether it's uh, being pure before God, or, or living before the lost properly, or giving God praise, all these general things that we should do, but we have a specific calling as well that's unique to your spiritual gift. And Paul said he was called to be an apostle. Fortunately, we have the rest of the Bible to study, and in Acts, when he was recounting his testimony to some uh, Jews, he said this, he said, uh, God told me to depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. That's Acts 22, 21. Again, an apostle is one sent forth. Look in verse 3. Paul says he's an apostle concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So Paul's saying, I received the grace necessary to be an apostle, to be someone sent forth for all the Gentiles. And you're going to find here that Paul is passionate about the Gentiles, about the non-Hebrews. And he basically takes ownership of their souls. In verse 14, read with me, he says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. He says, I've been called to these people. I've been gifted by the grace of God to preach to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've been sent to them. I, who am a Jew, I'm going to go to the Gentile people. I'm going to go because they've been called to do that. Look at verse 15. So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Did you notice there? He's, he was ready to do what? To preach. He's an apostle. He didn't say, I'm ready to cast out devils. I'm ready to heal everybody. I'm ready to do all these miraculous things. He says, oh, no, I'm an apostle. I'm one sent forth to preach the gospel, to give light to people. Turn to Romans chapter 11. Very quickly, Romans 11. You'll see in verse number 13, he again declares his apostleship. Verse 13, Romans chapter 11. For I, Paul, speak to you, Romans Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. He says, I am the chief missionary to all the Gentiles. I'm the apostle. Verse number 15 of chapter 15. Romans 15, verse 15. Go there very quickly if you would. You're only going to turn one more place and you'll be, you'll be done for turning. So hang out in Romans 15 for a moment. Verse 15, Paul says, Nevertheless, brethren... Verse 15, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God that I should be the minister or apostle or missionary that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. What did I say last week? Every Christian 
is gifted by the grace of God for the glory of God. He just said right there, I was gifted by the grace of God to do this. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4, or 3 rather, and hang on to that thought about gifted by the grace of God. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 3, this will be the final passage. I'll, th I'll make a few more comments and then we'll be done with the apostleship. Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, <clears throat> if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me to you, word, uh, jump down to verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, verse 7, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me, who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So the call to be a missionary, the call to be sent forth to preach the gospel to the unsaved world is a spiritual gift. You say, well, I always thought it was a calling. Exactly. If you've been given the gift of missionary work, you have been called to missionary work. And by the way, you better have the gift of missionary work if you're going to be a missionary. How many of you have ever seen these missionaries come through and you say, man, these people are special people? How many of you have thought that? I've said for a long time, missionaries are my heroes. They're the greatest of all Christians. Uh, they, th they are the elite but I've made a mistake over the years by looking at them and assuming that it comes from them. I look at them and say, man, how can they give up everything and go there? How can they be so strong? How can they be so spiritual? And I, I begin to lift them up and think, man, they're so special, which they are, by the way, but they're so special because the grace of God has enabled them to be so special. I said last week, if you're a Christian, you're gifted. And if you're a Christian, then that makes you special. Missionaries are special because they're gifted. How many of you have said to yourself, I could never leave America and go there, wherever there is? Yeah. Primarily for the food. That's my problem. Yeah. But the reality is, if God taps you on the shoulder and gifts you with missionary work, oh yeah, you'll leave America in a heartbeat. Because you're, the grace of God is enabling, to do, enabling you to do that. I could never leave my family, you might say. I could never leave what I have and go to those conditions and deal with those people. Yes, you could if the grace of God gifted you to do that. Paul, the apostle, on multiple occasions said he was an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. He said he was ordained an apostle to the Gentiles. Ordained, he was uh, appointed an apostle to the Gentiles. So the question is for everyone this morning. What maybe you never considered possible, I wonder if you should be more open to, what is the will of God for your life? And do not worry about whether or not you could do something or not. Ask yourself, has God enabled you to do that? Has He gifted you with that? Is the will of God for you to be a missionary, to be an apostle? Have you been ordained, not by man, but by God, to be a missionary, to be an apostle somewhere, somehow? What is your spiritual gift? Are you gifted? with the missionary calling. If you are, you will not be content sitting in the pew very long. If you are gifted with the gift of apostleship, then you will not be spiritually satisfied until you put that gift to good use. If God has gifted you with such a calling, then what seems impossible will quickly seem possible because of the enabling of the grace of God. This is the first gift of Christ for the body of Christ because the body of Christ needs a missionary before it needs a pastor. You cannot have a church without a church builder. You cannot have a church for a pastor to pastor or for a music minister to minister or for a children's ministry to minister if you don't have a missionary, a church builder, a pioneer who first will build that church. And so 
Historically, yes, the 12 apostles were the beginning of the church, but practically today, any church that starts, it has to be started by somebody that has that pioneer spirit to go where no one's gone, to, to, to win converts to Christ, disciple them, and begin a church. That's a missionary. That's an apostle. And that requires somebody with a special spiritual gift given by the grace of God. And when any church is started, God gets the glory for that. Amen? The, the believer, he might be here today, she might be here today, who has been given this gift will typically have a pioneer spirit, a bold spirit. Passing tracks is not a struggle for the person with this spiritual gift. The fear of man typically is not a problem for this person. Again, you meet these missionaries, and they aren't afraid of anybody, it seems. Uh, they're willing to pass a tract out to anybody, talk to anybody. They're willing to go anywhere. And sometimes I see them and I think, man, what a coward I am. When in reality, these people have been gifted with a specific gift for them that builds churches. I know I don't have that gift. But I also know what I have been gifted with and where, what I belong and where I belong. So you've got to know where you belong and give credit not to ourselves or to someone else, but to the grace of God. Amen? The fear of culture is typically not a struggle for the person with this spiritual gift. Uh, this person uh, who has this gift will possess an unusually strong burden for the lost. But they do not have to possess miraculous powers like the twelve apostles. Do you know an apostle scripturally is not a magician? <laughs> it's, it's just the guy who's going to preach the gospel. Now, the 12 apostles were given unique gifts to them. I won't have you turn there because we're almost done, but read it sometime in the Gospel of Luke. But when Jesus Christ was about to be crucified, he got the apostles together. He said, come here, guys. You've been enjoying my protection. You've been enjoying my divine protection. Everything's been cool. But go get yourself a sword. And go get some money because it's not going to be the same anymore. I'm about to be crucified. I'm going to ascend I'm not going to be here anymore, and life's going to be a little more challenging for you. That tells me that their ministry was unique. You can look through the book of Acts if you know your Bible, and those 12 apostles would still do some miracles in the book of Acts, but by and large, their ministry was not healing, it was preaching. By and large, their ministry was not miracles, it was witnessing. And so Jesus said to them, before he ascended, hang out here in Jerusalem, power is going to come from the Holy Spirit, and you're going to be witnesses unto me here in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the world. You're going to be witnesses unto me. That's what an apostle truly is. A believer with the gift of apostleship doesn't feel like they fit into the body of Christ unless they're expanding out the body of Christ. That's just the reality. You know what I wanted to do since I met Brad Barkowski? I wanted to convince him that he belongs here. I would love for him to come here and do a lot of good things. He is full of incredible energy. Uh, he is full of, of positive thinking. That sounds psycho, you know, psychopathic to you, but we need that. He's gifted in so many things. I want to convince him he belongs here. But you know what? If I did that, he would be very unhappy here. Because his gifts, as much as we see them useful to us, his gifts are to go and expand the body of Christ, to reach souls beyond this building and this geographical area. His gifts are to go. I couldn't keep him here. Because God's put something in him that says, Pastor, I don't want this chair. I want that town. That's just how he is. Meet a true missionary gifted with the gift of apostleship, and that's who they are. And that's what they want to do. So, if you are a member of the body of Christ, then you are a member of the gifted. What is your spiritual gift? Number one, and that's all we'll talk about today, is it the gift of apostleship? Pray about that. Ask the Lord what he would have for you and what your role is in building this church or the bigger picture, building the bigger church. Let's stand and have a word of prayer.